Thank you so much. We got batteries in here today, Danny. <laughs> so we're good. <coughs> Continuing on into uh, the book of Daniel, and uh, we are in between verse 20, we're chapter 9, excuse me, uh, chapter 9, verses 20 and tw to 23. And um, we are uh, uh, into the, the last part of the, the prayer that Daniel had, uh, that he was praying in uh, chapter 9. Laying out his supplications to God, and uh, it is an awesome prayer. And um, now we see the answer to that prayer, and uh, how quickly that it happened, and what was happening with that in these three verses. We uh, <clears throat> will be uh, have we finished that uh, twenty four through uh, twenty seven will be the what's called the uh, seventy weeks prophecy, and. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, how important it is, uh, so extremely important uh, today because where people get all messed up at and where people get all, uh, I guess, confused about uh, end times and about all the things that are happening and the things that are happening right now is they do not have an understanding of this at all <clears throat> or they have it all messed up. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And um, so we'll be spending some time at the end of this chapter uh, going through in that and explaining quite a bit there. Because it's really what sets off any of the false teaching or false ideas or the confusion goes back to the Old Testament, comes back to here. We wouldn't know anything about uh, a lot of things. We wouldn't know really hard anything about the tribulation period. If it wasn't for this, uh, this tells us about that. It gives us those details. And so it's very important. <clears throat> but we see uh, Daniel, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat or something here, <clears throat> is, uh, has been uh, laying out his, his prayers. Now if you'll uh, jot this down, uh, Daniel 9, Ezra 9, and Nehemiah 9. Those four books, and they're all chapter 9, so that's easy enough to remember, but Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. If you want to know how to pray, and how to pray uh, uh, according to what is going on in current events, Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9. All those prayers are some awesome prayers. And it's funny how, you know, the guy that, that put all, uh, all the chapters and verse uh, breaks and all that in the scripture sometimes it was real good and a lot of sometimes it was real bad it did, he changed it they didn't do it at the right spot um but uh it's funny how, how god's hand is still even in somebody that, that does that later for us to make it easier to find stuff and and set this up but all those prayers are right there daniel 9 ezra 9 nehemiah 9 and uh, uh those are all contemporaries are going to be praying and and we've talked about last week about his prayer and what he's doing. And this week, uh, we see uh, the end of it, <clears throat> how it's answered, and, and, and all that as we go through. Um, so one and, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still getting something there. The one and two is the setting of the book. You know, uh, uh, the one talks about when they took him into uh, captivity uh, and, and goes through the history of the book. Now we're in the prophetic section of the book. It's about year 538 is about where we're at. And Daniel is now in his 80s, as we've talked about. Um, and uh, we, we also learned earlier that, that Daniel's been a student, uh, not of the bestseller of the day, not of, of the latest writings uh, from Nebuchadnezzar, not of the, the uh, Babylonian uh, newspaper or, uh, or whatever. He has a, been a student of the Bible. And we saw that last week, and we see that again this week in our, our sermon and our scripture that Daniel spent time in the Word of God because he knew things about what was going on. Because of that, he understood the times. He understood where everything was at on the prophetic scale for him. 
Uh, they knew where they were going to be at in that time period that's there. Um, just by studying the Bible and studying the scripture. And that's very important for us because uh, so many people get, get their, their eschatology from whatever they can find off YouTube or you know, or this or that or some. And there's a bunch of crazy folks out there, I'm telling you. Now, there's a lot of good people on YouTube. I listen to a lot of, of seminary professionals and a lot of preachers and all that uh, that are really good who put their stuff out there. And uh, they have podcasts and they're, you know, uh, 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 audio sermons and, and listen to. And, and I've just spent a lot of time uh, that way. And those that are pre uh, teaching through books and teaching through concepts, and I, I do that, that's fine. But, boy, there's some wild stuff out there, everything under the sun. And um, so you have to, have to be careful with that. But you have to know and understand and have a good understanding of Scripture. Um, we've seen that already, that if you don't under, have a good understanding of the Old Testament, you're going to have a problem in the New Testament. There's some things that are not going to make sense to you, and you're going to get off in your doctrine if you do not understand the Old Testament. And that's where a lot of people get off, because everything that you study. When you study something and you find a particular doctrine there, that has to be uh, uh, fleshed out amongst the whole Bible. You know, if you don't understand it, and it's talking about, as we talked about, rams and goats and leopards and all kind of weird stuff and horns growing up, and it gets kind of confusing, you know, what in the world is it? Um, it'll be explained. The Bible is real good. God is real good about explaining what he has said, either in uh, subsequent chapters or books, or, or backwards, uh, those, it'll be there somewhere. If it's not in that same context, then it will be either in the New Testament, it'll be explained, or if it's in the New Testament, you may find in the Old Testament where it's explained and helps, helps us to do that. The problems we get into is we take one uh, uh, doctrine that we think is a doctrine right from one verse, and we, we just say that's just the way it is, and we just take it like it is with no context. Uh, and it's so important that we have the context of all of Scripture. And that's where it's important, certainly uh, where we will be at and right now in Daniel is extremely important. Um, it, it, uh, I'll tell you, right now it it's, it's just uh, gets worse and worse with the ideas that are out there. And it all comes from a false understanding or not a good understanding of this chapter that we're in right now. So um, we see here that, that Daniel, uh, in uh, his, he's been praying and... Um, uh, he, he, he has uh, laid out his, his uh, 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 said he's, 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 he tells God, said, incline your ear, hear, open your eyes, behold all our desolations. This is in uh, 14, uh, 18. And the city was called by your name, Jerusalem. You know, we don't present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for your great mercies. Uh, Lord, hearken, defer not for the own sake in your city and your people that are called by your name. He's, he's laying himself out in, in, in great uh, 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 prayer to God. And in verse 20, where we'll start, it says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, <laughs> even the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. <laughs> I'm giggling because it's like, <laughs> that's God, man, right in the middle of the prayer. Boom, I'll answer that right now, <laughs> that quick. I'll send Gabriel right now. And, and boy, I tell you, I, love, I just love God. <laughs> it's what he need. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding or insight, as some say, uh, 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 translations say, but skill and understanding, skill in understanding also. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So we see uh, 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 Daniel who is uh, just laying it out there and, and he is in his prayer that comes along with Bible study uh, because we knew that he studied Jeremiah because that's where it came from that he would know that the 70 weeks 
are about to end, okay? So he's about three, four years, two or three years, whatever, from the end of that 70 weeks that they're pulled out of Jerusalem and, and taken into captivity in Babylon, and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and well, Belshazzar is, but uh, that Babylonian uh, kingdom is gone, and now the Medes and the Persians are there, and, uh, and remember we talked about Greece was coming, and then Rome, and then of course there's two more kingdoms coming after that that we have not seen yet, but we saw those. We talked about those all through Daniel. But all this time, and the things that are going on, he's praying. And he, he's doing that through the, uh, the studying of the scriptures. And, and like I say, right now it's very important that we understand and study our scriptures. Um, when we pray, we're speaking to God. We're laying out our supplications and our needs before him. When we read the Bible, that's when we allow God to speak to us. And it doesn't, you can't have one without the other. They got to go together. Um, because, you know, there's people that say, well, God told me this or that. Well, did he really? Does it, does it match up with this or does it go against anything there? You have to be real careful about what you feel or what you hear. We see that Daniel uh, uh, knew what God wanted him to do. He laid it on his heart. He knew from studying the Bible that confirmed what he would know and what confirmed what uh, Gabriel is coming to answer his, his prayers. So it goes together. It's very important uh, uh, for that. And uh, he's, he's uh, uh, we see, as, as a sure enough prayer warrior. Um, a lot of times we, you know, uh, we pray. Uh, we pray for... When we eat and we pray maybe in the mornings before the day starts or we pray uh, different times, you know, whatever. Or maybe we just pray once in a while. Maybe we don't even pray till we get to church. And uh, we might have a silent prayer then and we might not. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's hard to have a relationship if we're not involved in prayer, if we're not in Bible study. Because you've, you've cut off communication with the Holy Spirit. And you can't hardly have any communication with the Holy Spirit if there's not prayer and if there's not Bible study, they go hand in hand. You've got to give a, a God the opportunity to speak back to you. And I know that y'all have, y'all have all have probably been reading something in the Bible and been praying about something. All of a sudden, you read something uh, that somebody did, whatever. It could be anything, you know. Uh, you could be reading about King David. You could be reading about Jesus, one of the disciples, or whatever. And all of a sudden, it'll just hit you. You'll have an answer to your prayer. You'll go, ah, I just read that. Now I know. <laughs> I've been praying about this, and this is a similar thing that I can apply here. I know what God wants me to do. Um, and I know that you've experienced that. I know that most of you have at some point in time experienced that, how God just speaks to us through the Scripture, through the Bible. Um, but we see uh, um, that, that it's just as normal in the life, you know, in the child of God as breathing prayer should be. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, says, Pray without ceasing. Uh, continuously praying, always in a, in a, a, a manner of prayer. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that we, we have to stop and bow our heads and speak out loud. It may be uh, while we're driving down the highway, say, Lord, help me with, with this situation or whatever. Or pray for, for so-and-so. They're going through a difficult time. You know, they're going to have this surgery coming up and, and they've got a lot of problems. We just want to pray for them. It's just that easy. Where it's conversation, it's just your thoughts as you go along every day, all through the day as things happen. Um, Jesus in Matthew 7, uh, 7 through 11 says, Ask and we give unto you, seek, and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. And, and what that means is you, you ask and keep on asking, you, you seek and you keep on seeking, and you knock and you keep on knocking, and, and you keep on until you get an answer to prayer. Uh, God's going to give you an answer. Now, it may be a while. You know, sometimes, uh, 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 you know, well, if we're asking, we're in God's will. Absolutely within God's will. And we're praying for, to, to Him. He's going to answer that prayer. And it might be that He answers it soon. Maybe He does like Daniel. Before you even finish getting the words out of Him, you, you got an answer. But it might be years. It might be decades. Or it may be in a different way than you're, you're praying for. Um, you know, I've had things that, that uh, we prayed for. I remember even at, at our church uh, before, many years ago, we'd pray for, for something and it wouldn't work out. And we just knew it had to be. This is the way it was going to be. Um, but it took time. 
God had to do some stuff and some work in between in, in some people's lives and, and to do some things before that prayer would be answered. It was answered, but it was delayed. And we knew what the answer would be. We were clear, but it wasn't time yet. And so, uh, you know, the thing is, you just keep praying and let him work out the details. So we want to pray about uh, uh, our, our, our group and our church and our people here. Uh, we pray and then we just keep praying and let him work out the details. Let him work it out how things are going to be and what he's going to do. Um, but it's a habit of prayer. It's a repetition of prayer. Daniel, you know, got in trouble for praying because that's the only thing that he did wrong, the air quotes, uh, to uh, the people with him in the government. They couldn't find nothing that he did wrong. He did everything right, you know. They couldn't find anything, anything to get him on. They hated him. They despised him. They wanted him out of there. They wanted him dead. It wasn't just they wanted him gone. They wanted him dead. And so they got up, made up this rule, got to the king and goes, hey, you know, if somebody doesn't pray to you uh, within the next 30 days, we'll throw them in the fiery furnace or, or I mean, throw them in the lion's den. Excuse me, I'm getting all mixed up. Throw them in the lion's den. And uh, that'll solve it. You know, that's the only thing we can get him on. Well, Daniel every day prayed three times a day when he chose to pray. He didn't have to pray three times a day. He could have done it any other time or whatever. He was just faithful. That's what he did. He opened the doors and he prayed toward Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where he was praying to. He was from Jerusalem. He kept praying for his country that has been destroyed and praying for the people. Because he's a leader. He's, people are watching him. He, he's going to be the example of how to live when you've been taken captive out of your country. So he's, he's, he's praying and praying for that. And so they come by, look in the window. There he is praying. Let's get him. Now here he is. Look, king, you know, throw him in there. Uh, let them lions eat him up. But he was, he was going to continue on no matter what. And that's the way it should be with our prayer that we continue and we pray uh, uh, continuously and, and do what God wants us to do. So, but we look at the stuff here in, in verse 20. Man, there's a variety of things that he's, he's, uh, he's doing here. So he's speaking <clears throat> and praying. So he's, he's praying, but he's also, he's, he's got silent and, and uh, out loud prayer. He's speaking. He's actually talking and praying to God out loud. There in his home uh, with his windows open, just like he always has, praying toward Jerusalem. Um, if you've ever seen the, uh, the Hebrew letter, uh, called Shin or whatever. It's it's it looks like a W, but but it's got one side that kind of comes out like this, and you got two points up, and it kind of comes out, and and it's it looks like a head with two arms up praying, and that was the the normal posture that they would pray in. Uh, we we bow our heads and all that. Well, they didn't close their eyes. They they prayed looking toward heaven, um, and that was the normal stance of prayer. Um, and uh, that word comes from that. But anyway, uh, 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 that's what he would be doing. He would be praying, praying out loud, praying silently because he was speaking and praying. And then he was confessing his sin. He, he's, he's keeping his life unsullied and clean before God. You know, uh, uh, here's a man that, that nobody could find any fault in and do anything wrong in, but he understands that he's got sin in his life, but he is sinful. And he's praying and confessing that to God. And then uh, uh, the sin of my people Israel. This is the man <clears throat> who loves his people and he's praying for them. And that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 the thing that, that, of course, that we want to do is, is with our deacons and we pray for our people. But he's praying for the sin of the people of Israel because they've been cast out. You know, we talked about why. Why 70 years? Because it was 70 Sabbaths that they did not keep the Sabbath, that year-long Sabbath. And so God says, you're not going to follow me and do what I want done. And they were starting to worship idols and do a lot of other things that were going on. You're going to kick you out of the land for 70 years. I'll give it a rest. I'll give it 70 years rest since you refuse to do that. I'm going to get it because it's my land and I'm going to get it one way or the other. So I'll just kick you out and let the land lay fallow for 70 years. And then you can come back. And so he knows and understands that, that it's going to be a uh, time. He also understands that God is limited in his judgment. It's not going to be forever. Uh, his judgment is limited on, on, his, on his people. The sin of the people of Israel. He's going to do whatever he's got to do to bring them back <clears throat> to him. But it's limited in time. 
And uh, uh, it's not just, well, you're done. Get out of here. You're, I'm never going to mess with you again. Though some people think that today. Some people believe God has taken his hand off Israel and has forgotten them completely. And they're done. They are, they are irredeemable. Uh, and, and they're just gone. And, and they won't be saved and, and all that. That's it. In fact, we are probably a, a minority now of those that do not believe that way, of course. Um, and, and that's probably the majority of denominations and everything out there now is, is uh, Israel's, Israel's done. Um, but he's praying for them. And that's so important part, that intercessory prayer to pray for each other and pray for our people. Um, you know, that's what helps knit our hearts together as a church is the praying for each, each one of us and to pray for everybody. We got it all in the bulletin. There's other things that you see and you hear as we talk and as we, we uh, converse and we fellowship together. There's plenty of things going on that you can pray for and pray for the, pray for the people of our church. And he does that. He's presenting his supplication before the Lord, uh, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, which I guess is Mount Sinai is what he's uh, uh, praying for that, that that holy mountain of my god he's praying for for the temple mount he's praying for that again to, for jerusalem to be able to come back to that he's, he's lifting that up in prayer um but the variety of prayer the different kinds of prayers is is, is just a uh, uh, fascinating as we look at God's word, all the things. He has all these different prayers. He's wanting God to help supply a, a need and, and the importance of us being able to, to pray for each other. You know, in uh, uh, John uh, uh, 5, 14 says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And that's what's important is that we pray according to God's will. Now, sometimes it's, his will is not our will. <laughs> you know, it, um, it can be kind of tough. He's not praying that uh, God will come in and destroy the Babylonians right now and get them back. Though that may happen and is going to happen. Um, he, it's not what he's praying about. He knows that they're stuck there. They got 70 years. He spent all this time praying. He knows what God's will is through studying the Bible, and he knows how to pray. He's not praying something that's outside of God's will. He's starting to pray now for his people and for the forgiveness of their sins and everything else so they will come together. He's already two or three years or four years ahead of time, so they will be ready at the time that God is going to allow them to go back to Jerusalem and start rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple and doing that, that they will be in the heart and mind to be doing that and not be a, a, a way and out of their relationship with God. He's praying according to God's will. A lot of times, a lot of things we pray for, unfortunately, is not in accordance with God's will. It's usually in accordance with our will. And there's nothing wrong with praying for our needs and the things we want, but a lot of times it's just a checklist of, of things that we think that we need or want in our lives and not any thought of anything else of what God may want in our lives. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we do that. And you know, like I say, uh, uh, if you're not a student of God's word, you're not going to have a real good uh, uh, idea of what to pray for and, and how to pray. In James uh, 4, 2 through 3, he talks about how many times we ask amiss and ask amiss on things. And what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasure that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because what? You do not ask. And that was the problem they were having in James. All the things you're going because they weren't spending the time in prayer. They weren't asking. They weren't asking in accordance uh, to God's will. Uh, we got to be able to do that. Today we see people who do not understand where we are in the timeline. They have absolutely no idea whatever. And they pray for things that, that may be good things, but they're not going to happen. Um, you know, I, I know that there's people, there's a group of people that are really pushing this, that there's going to be a worldwide revival. God is going to do it. He's going to revive the whole world. Now understand that they think that they're slowly building the kingdom. Okay, they're getting things better and better. But God is going to work through our 
governors and through our presidents and through our political system. He's going to work through uh, our, our plans of, of being able to get unity with Muslims and Catholics and we'll finally all come together as one in unity and, and we'll, we've all got common ground. We're going to come together and we're going to keep on and God's going to bring a huge revival of people and the whole world will just become really good and everything's going to be great. And then Jesus is going to finally step in to Jerusalem and rule from Jerusalem now that we've got everything fixed in the world. I hate to break it to you, and I know we're here on Memorial Day remembering our fallen uh, veterans and our fallen people, and, and I, I love the United States, and I love everything else, but let me tell you something. You're not going to save the United States. You're not going to save the world. You know, we're going to save individuals for the coming kingdom of the world that God, Jesus' kingdom. We want to save uh, souls, but we're not going to save this world. And, and to, to have this idea that and, and a lot of these, they, they have a lot of other problems too, but they, they pray for this huge revival. There's nothing wrong with revival. It's start revival right here. Revive my heart. Get my heart right first and then my family, then my, my, my church and the people and, and revive us, but not this whole thing, this whole idea is, is rooted in the idea that we're all going to finally come together and everything's going to be great. Uh, and, and that is not God's will. We know, we've already been through Daniel enough to just absolutely know what God's will is. Guess what? It ain't going to be good. They got 70 years. Well, we're going to learn that there's 483 years that's going on, and there's going to be seven more years that, that's coming. And uh, uh, God has already said it's going to get worse and worse. We're in perilous times. They will come, and, and that's the way it is. We need to be praying that God's will be done, that God would help protect us as, as Christians and allow us to spread the gospel even more and use the, the things that we know that are coming to, to prick people's hearts of their sin and convict them so we might be able to, to share the gospel with them and make a, make a difference in their life. So it, it's a whole different idea of how to pray, how to pray properly, how to pray to God's will because we understand and know what God is doing in the world. He understood and knew what God was doing. He knew they only had a few years left of being over there in, in Babylon, and he doesn't know how it's going to work. He actually thinks that probably the kingdom is coming, uh, that Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom is, is what he really believes, but he doesn't know because he doesn't know the future. He's just like us. He, he knows it's going to end, and so it'll probably end in the kingdom. They've been looking for the kingdom, you know, for forever. Uh, and, and so they're not forever, but you know what I'm saying. For a long time, they've been looking for the, the for this kingdom, and and they didn't. You know, when is it going to be? They don't know. Uh, you know, he gets that answer. By the way, and we'll talk about that. He will get that answer yet, and he hasn't got it yet. So he doesn't know at the point in time, but he will know. And in fact, uh, if Pharisees knew how to count and understood Daniel, they would have knew exactly to the day. When Jesus came in riding that donkey, they would have said, this is the kingdom. We missed it. <laughs> this is it. They better recognize who he is. They would have known that the king was there, but they rejected him. They crucified him instead. But you can add that to the day, to the exact day and know. And they could have done the same thing. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so we see that, that it's important to, to be praying to God in his will into, into what uh, 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 God's will is. That, that's so important. You don't get that without Bible study and studying. Now, did Daniel just read one time, just real quick, once over, Jeremiah, and, and be done with it? No, he spent a lot of time in it. And I'm going to tell you, um, the, the, the importance of Bible study is, 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 is very important for us as Christians. Um, I want to ask you if you, uh, uh, those of you that have in any kind of professional job that you had to study for to get a license or to, uh, 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 to get anything, you know, whatever you kind of, uh, you know, whatever it might be in your job, did you just uh, uh, have a, a little devotional reading of the stuff that you do for an insurance uh, test or for a real estate test or nurses test or doctors test or or whatever you just kind of get a eh, you know just get a little devotional reading you know uh, most people we we get the uh, get the little uh, open windows thing or we get a, a brand you know 
daily bread thing. We read that. We get our daily liver quiver, you know. Oh, that sounds good. We get the little devotional books. And they're okay if you're at that level for a little bit, but you've got to get beyond that. When we read a little short paragraph, they'll have a little snippet of a, of a verse and how God's going to help us through that day. And that, that's a good thing. Not necessarily bad, but there's got to be more than that. Amen. That's the one that's, that's sitting there and, and uh, you know, goes to a meal and they just, uh, uh, just kind of skim off the top and just eat a little dab and go on and leave the rest of it, you know. Uh, I, you know, guys that would eat their, get their meal and they'd eat their cake and then they'd eat the, <laughs> eat the meal and get the cake first. And uh, so a lot of folks, we get the dessert, we get that little bit, we don't get the rest of it, we don't get the meat, we don't get the, the carbohydrates and the, and the uh, protein to, to uh, keep our blood levels up all the way through the day, you know, something that will stretch us out. Um, and let me tell you, Daniel did not get that from just a, 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 a little bit of a reading over uh, the scriptures that he had and just kind of, well, I looked at it, I done read that about a month ago, I don't know why I need to read it again, you know, that kind of thing. But it's so important because that's the issue that we see today in our churches. Why is a majority of our churches filled with, with false ideas and apostate pastors? Why does I get online, I've started printing them off every single week. There's some mega church pastor or a leader of a denomination or a singer, big time singer and all the, especially the uh, uh, contemporary Christian music uh, the singers and all that will come out and say, I'm no longer a Christian, never was, I don't have nothing to do with this anymore, I'm an unbeliever and I want to be that way, I'm done with this. Why, why are they doing that after, some of them wrote books, there's been a couple of them who wrote lots of books and other people read them and, and were blessed by them as a Christian author and pastor and they said it's been fake this whole time, all these years of building this mega church, three or four or five thousand people. And I'm done with it. I'm out of here, you know. And and they lead so many people astray. Why do we have these that, that are these obvious heretics uh, continuing on and continuing on? You know, people will still follow them. It's because they're not ever going to get in here. They have a devotional type reading of the Bible. If they read it at all, it's going to be something they read out of a book somewhere, or they'll just take a little bit and go on. They're not getting into it and studying it. You. There's some stuff that you can read. If you're a brand new Christian, you don't understand a lot, and you're just learning, there's, there's plenty here for you to be able to read. Even if you're not a good reader, okay? Everybody's at a different level. I understand that. And, and maybe your, your reading level isn't that good. You can still get something. God is going to speak to you if you read through that. Even if you don't understand everything, you don't understand even some of the big words or whatever. God's going to speak to you. Uh, even as a young person and, and didn't have a great vocabulary or whatever, I could read the Bible. I could get a lot out of it. I could understand something. May not have known how it's <coughs> all going to work, but I could. God can speak to us through that. And the idea that we have today that there's, there's nobody really studying the Bible. There's nobody really intently. You can spend a lot of time. God has made this so deep, so easy to read and, and shallow and easy for anyone, to, even the one that's the most uh, you know, uh, academic mind, so smart and, and be able to dig through and, and, and for all that, for, for extremely deep study. It's why the Word of God is so perfect because you can study it your whole life as deep as you want and still not get all the riches and the gold nuggets out of that scripture. I mean, you'll still won't get it all. There'll still be there. There'll still be things that you'll find because God continually speaks through his word. That's what we see today. Everybody gets off on all the crazy stuff that's going on in our world today is, is because of, of just not spending time in the word. Daniel spent time in the word. We're talking about his prayer here, but he was also talking about him reading this in Jeremiah. He spent a massive amount of time studying the word and praying together. And, uh, and that's so important. If y'all would, uh, some of these, uh, 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 I'll be honest with you, the contemporary Christian music thing that's, that's uh, come on now, 90% of them guys live a horrible life. I'm telling you, they, 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 they drink and party and carry on and do all kind of stuff. They don't live anything, probably live worse than a lot of unbelievers. They have no qualms whatsoever. It has nothing, there's no change in their life. You get down to them, they live terribly. Some of these uh, uh, big evangelists, they live a, a horrible, 
I mean, uh, just ungodly lifestyle. Uh, I've known guys in law enforcement work security for one of them, uh, one of the big, big name ones. <laughs> He's got lots of Gulfstream jets, flies everywhere, and uh, he can tell you stories. Guy cusses like a sailor, drinks, does stuff, been known to take drugs, do whatever, laughs at people. You know, behind the stage, they're all laughing at these people that are who are coming up in a wheelchair thinking that he might be able to heal them, who are really genuinely thinking that this will be the time I might be able to get healed of cancer, or I can, I can do that, that they come and they don't know any better and they give all the money to them and they giggle at them in the back, you know, about how they took them. And, uh, you know, uh, just, just that. And there's so much of that. There's so much of hypocrisy and things that are going on in our world today. And I'll tell you, our, our young people, unfortunately, and but not just our young people, a lot of our people, they have such a weird idea about Jesus, such a strange idea about the Bible, just a, a crazy idea about the God's will and, and his, his, how he acts because they don't understand it. You want to know God? You've got to get in that book. That's it. You want to know him and his character, his true character? You've got to get in there. Uh, the big thing today is, you know, the Jesus uh, the, uh, of the Bible, well, Jesus was the nice lovey-dovey guy, but... Uh, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament because that God was a mean and, and vengeful God and, and, and he's, he's a bad person. Uh, we don't, don't want to have nothing to do with that. Uh, that's wrong. We want to be with this nice and lovey-dovey Jesus that allows everyone to come no matter, no matter what they are. Uh, allows the gays and lesbians in and everything. We'd never say nothing bad about it. We're just going to let everything happen. That's the God that we need to worship. And people go, oh yeah, well I guess that's right. They don't know. Um, and and uh, it's because of, of not spending any time in the Word, not understanding what God has, has said. But we see that um, uh, in through this, uh, uh, Daniel was that man who, who was rooted in the Word. And us as Christians, if we want to grow in Christianity, if we want to grow in our relationship, we've got to be rooted in Word. We've got to be rooted in prayer. I could care less how many people come in here on Sunday morning. I do like to have a few people to look at when I'm talking, but I really could. I'm going to tell you, I, I could care less. I was listening to something the other day on the church revitalization planning stuff, which I try to study a bunch of that, and they were going on there introducing this guy. He's a great speaker. He's a good guy. And they said, yeah, he, he got this church. in like two or 3,000 in this church. Like, it's a big deal. I said, they're probably not that good of a church. <laughs> I don't know. The way it looks today, the bigger the church, the worse it is. I don't know. Not necessarily. I'm not saying that 100%, but it's almost that way, right? We see these huge churches, the one that's falling out all the time. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe a smaller church is better. But if I can get uh, us to grow, to grow more, when, when somebody tells me, hey, you know, I've been reading the Bible through in a year, and I'm way ahead, and I'm doing it, that, that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Somebody go, you know, I, I, I finally stayed, started reading the Bible more and more all the time. And I've got so much out of it. That's what we're looking for is us continually growing. All of us need help. I mean, I know none of us perfect. I'm not. Y'all well, might be, but I'm sure not. You know, and I'm a preacher and I still don't do as much as I should do uh, as anyone else, just like y'all. But as we grow and as we study and spend time, and, and that's what I want to see is us grow closer spiritually and spiritual growth because God will give us other growth if it gives us spiritual growth. If we have the spiritual growth, we're going to uh, uh, be able to have that opportunity to share the gospel. Sometimes God doesn't give us that opportunity because we're not ready because we couldn't share the gospel if we had to. We, couldn't, we didn't know what to say. We didn't know what to do. Well, let me call the preacher right quick see if he can talk to you <laughs> or whatever. Pull him out like a, like a sword. Here you go. Uh, when It's your job. Do it. I don't know if I can do that. Okay, then it's time to get started and start working on that and get that fixed. Uh, that's what I want to see is, is spiritual growth. Uh, God will bring people. He will do all that stuff as long as there's more spiritual growth in, in, our, in our lives. But we see that, that uh, uh, Gabriel, he, he said, while he was speaking in prayer, um, uh, uh, the Gabriel, who had seen the vision at the beginning, he saw him in this, this vision. He was being caused to fly swiftly. Gabriel does that. He runs uh, messages for God, and, and he has, has done that to come and, and give him understanding. He already had talked to him before on his visions and explained things to him. And God had dispatched him from heaven to be there. Something about angels here is they aren't omnipresent like God. They are not everywhere at once all the time. Angels can move swiftly, 
uh, understand that. We see that from the Bible. We have examples. They can be there quick, but they have to take time. It does take time for them to move physically from one geographic location to another geographic location. It can be very quick. Maybe, maybe just a few seconds to cross and cross the earth. Uh, who knows? But it goes quick. But it, it is a finite being uh, that God has created. He sent Gabriel so that he might tell him and understand him. Um, and he touched him about the time of the evening oblation. Well, what's that got to do with anything? What's an evening oblation? That was the time of the sacrifice. You know, they had a sacrifice in the morning and then in the evening. Uh, a lamb in the morning, a lamb in the evening. Uh, Daniel is, is keeping track of the times and what's going on. He's, he's following everything. So he would be praying at the morning, time of the morning sacrifice, and praying at noon, and then praying at the evening sacrifice. He's praying and doing everything exactly as he would have been doing if they're still in Jerusalem. He's maintaining what God has told them to do. The temple is gone. They're, well, yeah, it's destroyed, but they're gone from the area. They're not even in the area. So that's the first chance for most of us to go, I'm not going to do nothing then. We don't have to worry about studying the Bible. We don't have to do anything. We get out of town, we go somewhere on a Sunday, or we, we don't be in church, well, I don't have to worry about it. You know, I'm fine. I, I'm not legally bound, you know. Well, Daniel would have been praying on Sunday morning. He would have been uh, doing everything he would have done. If he hadn't been in church, he would be somewhere doing what he would have done at the normal time he would be having church. That's the, uh, the, 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 the application today. He's following everything just like it would. We don't have the temple. We don't have the sacrifices. We know that it's going to come back. I don't know when, but it's going to come back. And I'm going to be praying about that time during the time that it would be. They kept those times and those seasons of everything where they were going. They weren't too completely taken out. I'm going to tell you, it's an absolute miracle of uh, May 14, 1948, when Israel became a nation, after being scattered for 2,000 years and scattered all over, all the things they've been through, there is no nation on the earth that has had that happen, ever. That has never happened. Um, you have a new couple move into your neighborhood. Uh, do you know, uh, you know, they said, well, we were uh, um, uh, Amalekites. You know, well, it's a nice Amalekite family, or, you know, that's a Jebusite family. They're from Jebusite. Do, that. do you see them? Do you see uh, Amalekites and Jebusites and Gergesites? You ever, do you see Gergesites today? Nope, they don't come to Kilgore and move in. Now yeah, we've got a colony up there in Northern California. We moved to Kilgore. We're, we're the Gergesites. They don't see that. They're gone. They're wiped out. They don't, they don't exist. There's nothing left. No, no civilization has ever uh, gone through that and survived. If they get taken over by another country within about a hundred years or less, they're already assimilated into that culture. Their, their culture is gone. There's no such thing. They're, they're not a part of that. They're, they're gone, done. Except Israel. Except the Jews. Because they continued to follow what God wanted them to do. And, and they're still there. And they're still all over the world. And they're still coming from all over the world to Jerusalem. That's an absolute miracle. That's what God said. I, I'm going to bring them back. Well, how can you bring them back? They've been scattered forever. They're, they're gone. No, they kept, mostly kept themselves pure. And they've continued on with their, their religion. And, and everywhere they've been. And they've continued on. And now they're coming back. And uh, they're, they're moving back. Uh, back to Jerusalem. And that is, that is unbelievable. Uh, as an answer to, uh, to uh, a prophecy in Isaiah, um, right off the top of my head, I think it's Isaiah 14. I may be wrong. I'm just pulling it out. I think it is where, where it says, will, is it, will a nation be born in a day? Uh, you know, it can't be. How, how do you born a, a nation in a day? Well, it was. Israel was literally in one day. It was born, and it was there. Uh, and it uh, didn't take the United States very long about that quick to recognize them as a country, and here they go. So uh, 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 that, that's an absolute miracle that we see that, that, that God has done. He's going to bring them back and has brought them back. Daniel is planning on that. He, he understands that how it's going to, he understands it's going to happen. He just don't know when or how or anything else. He, he doesn't have that information, but he's trusting God no matter what. And um, it says at the beginning of that supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Or, uh, or highly esteemed, as some says. I'm going to tell you, the Bible tells us that angels watch us. Do you know that? Do you know you're being watched all the time? And they watch us 
because I think that it's just so curious to them because they they are not uh, 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 redeemed. Okay, God didn't down Jesus didn't on the cross for angels. They're not redeemed, but they see grace that God has given us, and and uh, it's it's an unusual thing. And, and they watch us, they're continually watching us, seeing us grow, how we act, how we do. They are learning from us and all the things, and seeing how we do things. But they are watching us, and that they are uh, greatly beloved. Did you know you had a, re uh, uh, a re reputation in heaven? Right now, your reputation of how you live and how you do things is known in heaven. It is. God knows it. The angels know it. And, and Daniel had, had uh, uh, he was highly esteemed, as some translations put it, or greatly beloved because they seen the way he actually lived his life and what he did. That's the reputation that he had in heaven. And it's a lot to think about how we live and what we do today and how we react and, and everything else that we do that somebody is watching. God is always watching all the time, but angels are watching us and, and, and we're laying up, we're, we're setting our reputation in heaven. Not just here, not just amongst the people. You get on Facebook and, and all these social media and you look at everybody's page, well, everybody's great, everybody's wonderful. Nobody puts all the ugly stuff out there, they put the great stuff, right? You know, uh, and, and you think, well, they just got some great things going on in their family. Look at them, they're going vacation, they're going here, they just, they're so wonderful, their life must be wonderful and it may be horrible. <laughs> you know, who knows? They're not gonna put that out there. But they see the real reputation, the realness, and they could see through all that to see how Daniel was. He was greatly beloved in heaven. And uh, it says, therefore understand the matter, consider the vision. God wants us to understand what's going on. He wants us to understand and, and consider this vision. He wants us to understand that. Where we get off today, I'm gonna tell you that, that people do not teach Bible prophecy. Uh, it, it's, it's, most churches will never broach it. Uh, or if they do, they'll just kind of go over it. And well, I really don't know what that means. They'll be kind of figure it out and they'll just go right over it. And I've heard that before. I've said it to preachers that we're going over an area. And it's hard because actually 27% of the Bible is prophecy. Almost a third of it is prophecy. So it's pretty hard if you're also an expository preacher where you take chapters and verse by verse and you go all the way through. You're going to run into it. Almost every single book is going to have prophecy. And, 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 all, and most of it is, a lot of it has been fulfilled in Jesus, but almost every single book is going to have something about the end times prophecy. How do you, how do, you do that? You know, and I've heard it, well, I'm not sure I think this is that, and they'll make up something. They'll take it allegorical, which they never take nothing allegorical. No, they don't spiritualize nothing except when it comes to that because they just don't want to take the work to do that. God didn't make it so hard that none of us could understand it. Okay, he really didn't. It's really simple. It's not as, uh, you've got to do a little digging, you've got to do a little study, but you've got to be willing to be able to do that. And you've got to be able to look at everything uh, uh, across the whole board, across uh, across that. And he wants him to understand it. He didn't go, he's not fixing to telling him this 70 weeks prophecy to confuse him and to confuse everybody else. Well, I don't know what you mean, you know. 70 weeks are determined over a holy city and upon the holy uh, people and to finish the end of transgressions and sins. I don't know. I ain't never going to know, so I'm just going. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, he didn't know that. He wanted him to know. That's why Angel Gabriel came to him so that he would understand it. That's why we would understand it. This has never been disclosed before anywhere in Scripture at all, never. And he gets a whole new uh, revelation, basically, of what's going to happen. Why did he do that? Because he was greatly beloved. Because he was highly esteemed in heaven. He had a great reputation. He spent his time and his life in the word of God and in prayer. And spent his time with the word and living the way he should live. And God said because of that, uh, uh, Daniel didn't ask for this. He didn't ask to know this. He didn't even know nothing about it. God said, okay, because of the way you are and your reputation, I'm going to entrust this with you. I'm going to tell you this vision. And it's a, it's a pretty powerful vision. And it's, and it's, and it's uh, uh, good in some ways. In a lot of ways, it's really bad, really bad for the Jewish people. This is not good. Um, um, it, it talks about some really bad things were happening. But he entrusted Daniel with it because of, of, of his uh, character and because of the way that he lived. He wants him to understand it. He wants him to consider it. He wants him to study it. Consider the vision. Uh, so many nowadays, I've heard people say that you shouldn't even talk about it. Don't talk about none of that stuff. You know, it may scare people away. 
Uh, we don't want to talk about that. Um, Bible says consider it. Consider the vision. Study it. Understand the matter. It wants us to understand and know that. That was the biggest thing that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. You remember when he came to Jerusalem, he cried and wept. Wept bitterly over Jerusalem. Because they, they did not understand the time of his visitation. That was at the triumphal entry before he came in. Because they did not understand. And he said, if you would understood this... If you understand Daniel 70 weeks, and if you would have counted that out, you would have known that this was the day that your Messiah, the King, was coming and coming into the Jerusalem. They would have known that, and they chose not to. God wants us to understand those things. Um, don't, don't buy all this stuff. Well, it doesn't really matter. You know, we don't want to go all that. Let's just stay in the really good parts, the, the safe parts, the stuff that doesn't make us feel guilty or anything, doesn't really give us any responsibility. Let's stay in those parts of the Bible, just hit and pick whatever the, the not give best parts. You got to know all of it. It's all got to be together because anytime you take it out, you're taking it out of context. And that's what's so important. He wants us to understand and know that. And we're going to be spending some time in the last few verses of Daniel. Uh, there's a lot of things that are packed in there. They may get two or three sermons or more out of this, but there's a lot of things that are that are in here that we need to understand and know and have a good understanding of it because it sets the foundation. It's a blueprint, if you will, of a perfect foundation for, for us to understand what's going on in the world, what's going to happen, and then how to pray, how to live our life, and what to do. So it's very important. Just as Daniel did, it's going to be important for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we can spend so much time in your word studying and reading and, and, and praying that you open our minds and hearts to it and so we understand it. And Father, that we can do that and never exhaust all the things that are there. Father, I just pray that you would help us to understand, give us an idea of understanding, help us to take any biases that we have out uh, Father, but to look and to be open to, to your word and how you would uh, uh, interpret that for us, Father. Help us to, to, to have that desire. Father, I just pray that, again, we would pray. We would keep our lives open and unsullied for you. And, and Father, in relationship with you, closely and with you, that, that uh, uh, one, of, uh, that we confess our sins and, and, and live a life Father, that, that you would be proud of us to live. But Father, spend time in the Word so that we understand your character and your will for us each and every day. Father, I just pray that you to continue to work in and through each of us uh, and, and through our lives. Father, that uh, in, in the, the way that you can, through your still small voice, just speak to us as to what you would have us to do. We thank you for all those that are here. And Father, we thank you for our church. We continue to pray. For all our people, we just pray that we continue to grow uh, every day spiritually with you closer and closer, Father. That's, that's uh, all that I want and all that I would want to see and want to be considered successful in any way is that, uh, that we all come closer to you, uh, Father. Then, and uh, uh, once we do that, you'll take care of all the other details. You'll open the doors up for whatever they might be. But Father, we, our hearts have got to be prepared and ready for you to work in and through them. Make us fertile ground, Father, for your spirit to work in and through us in our, in our uh, fallen world that we have today. We thank you. We love you. We give you praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.